Hi. Yeah. So um, this is my end of October, start of November update. So April, May, June, July, August, September, October. Um, I guess if you're starting from May, six, seven months, half a year update. Um, so yeah, um, where I currently am, uh, where the group is, um, challenges, the plan going forward, that kind of stuff. Um, just a little update, really. Uh, so there, the main picture uh, on the left, I managed to take the group out to go eight, uh, Leeds Castle in Kent. Uh, good turnout, the group, lots of good fun. Um, yeah, it was just nice for them all to get stuck in. Um, as I said before, I coach athletes in various different places, Kingston, Canterbury, um, Norman Park in Bromley. And so, yeah, I might have a particularly large group, but I don't get to see all of them that often. Um, and they're, they're, they're very rarely all together at the same place. Um, but group unity is starting to become a thing. Uh, so it's really pleasing. Um, an example of that is um, if you look at uh, the picture in the bottom right um, with from left to right, Alex, Josh and Ollie, uh, they're in different counties for a start. Uh, Alex with the golden vest for Surrey schools and Josh and Ollie uh, with the Kent vest on. Uh, and Josh is in the northwest of Kent uh, in the Bromley area. Um, and Ollie is down in Canterbury, um, right down the other end of uh, Kent, which is a good 50, 60 miles away. Um, so it's very rare that all three of those boys uh, interact with each other all at once. Um, and it's the same goes with the rest of the group. And it's just really heartwarming um, that I think there's been a definite improvement in group unity um, this year. Uh, and I think one of the, the things I want to kind of foster amongst the group, especially with these youngsters, is like they do enjoy to train. They do like turning up. They're supporting each other. Um, and I think that makes a massive difference if one of them gets injured uh, or they go through a tough time. doesn't necessarily have to be an injury. Um, so, for example, um, well, we'll talk about it soon, but suppose somebody's going through a rough time. It just It's just so much better if the group's supportive and they've, they've got each other's backs. So, I'd like to think that's been fostered to a fairly good degree. Um, I wouldn't say it's the best, um, but it's a hell of a lot better than it was this time last year. Um, so where is the group? Um, so myself, the athletes, what's gone well? Um, loads of things. Uh, I think I said in a previous video that the average age of the athletes was quite young, um, so I wasn't expecting any international success. Um, I'll look at positioning first and then performance. Uh, when I look at positioning, um, the average position of everyone in the group was 10.6th in the UK, so just outside the top 10. Uh, seven of the 12 athletes were in podium positions, so first, second or third in the UK. Nine of them uh, are in the top 10. Um, and six of the 12, as I said, are ranked number one uh, in the UK, which is for, for a relatively small training group. Uh, some might argue it's large. Um, some might say it's small. Uh, it's all relative. Um, I think for that tight group of uh, 12, 14, 15, uh, to have so many in the top 10 and so many top three in the UK and even first. And it's not just first in one event. Some of them are first in the UK for multiples. Um, he's not going to like me dropping it in it, but uh, one athlete is number one in the UK for under 13 high jump. And he's number one in the UK for pentathlon. So it's not just one event. Some of these youngsters are number one in the UK. Some of them are, are multiple. Um, and if we look outside of the UK, um, Shane made a big step up this year and decided to compete for Trinidad and Tobago. Um, fully supported that decision, uh, enabled him to represent Trinidad and Tobago in the NACAC, which is the North American, Central American, Caribbean Games, um, and the Commonwealth Youth Games. 
uh, it's absolutely fantastic for the 110 meter hurdles under 18, uh, the 400 meter hurdles under 18, and the four by one, I believe he was in. Um, so yeah, he's he's the best in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, from what I can tell. I've got lots of UK top talent, international top talent now. Um, and yeah, I was saying in another video, I was expecting, despite the young age of the athletes, I was starting to, I was anticipating like reaping, um, not reaping, that's probably a bad word, but I was expecting uh, quite a lot of the athletes to claim to reap the uh, and some international honours. Um, and so there's now four, ranging from combined events to combined events, SIABs, uh, individual events for the SIABs um, areas, which is the NACAC I talked about, and and, and major games like Commonwealth Youth Games. Um, I'm still not anticipating any senior internationals. Uh, the average age of the group is still really young, um, something that's at the forefront of my mind. Um, but in total, five English schools medals, two golds, one silver, and two bronzes. Uh, an indoor well, loads of indoor champions. Um, we've already talked about in the summer one, but in terms of England athletics, outdoor champions, um, Ollie uh, with his octathlon championship record, first all time. Um, there's nothing to sneeze at considering it was once held by Sammy Ball, who nothing short of prodigious talent. Um, he's, he's, he's amazing. Um, and if Ollie is anywhere near that, that's, that's a credit to Ollie. Um, so yeah, in terms of positioning, um, athletes doing really well, uh, the athletes that aren't in the top 10, uh, one of the reasons why they're not in the top 10 is every single one of them have got another year in the age group, i.e. they're in the bottom of the age group or they're year two of three under 20. And so I'm anticipating this year, 2024 to be their time to strike. Uh, they know that. Uh, and they've been really positive and upbeat about it. Uh, they always knew that this year was going to be like the training year, uh, learning the events, that kind of thing. Um, so I think considering the positionings of the group, uh, the positionings of the ones that weren't as successful, shall we say, and the mitigating circumstances are they are at the bottom end of the year group and it's more competitive, um, that's perfectly fine. Uh, there's no real cause for concern. Um, the only athlete who didn't really compete uh, has sustained an injury last November um, doing gymnastics. And so that was outside of the group. Uh, there's no cause for concern in terms of uh, health and safety uh, of the group. I, I'd like to find, I like to think that um, I'm pretty on it uh, health and safety wise, and we're here to work hard, have fun, safe environment. Uh, supportive and nurturing so I, I i i see no issues there i'm well up to date with the health and safety regs um of uka um and speaking of uka uh now that's kind of offloaded its qualification route to england athletics and the other home countries so the last update which was april 2022 to april 23 I had just become a level two coach for jumps um, around about January. And that took an absolute age. Um, whereas now, not only am I a level two athletics coach for throws, uh, and I needed that specifically to be ensured to do discus and hammer, even though I'm probably never going to coach hammer. Uh, I am. I feel fairly confident to coach it. It's just, it's just not as part of my interest. Combined events is where I am. Um, I'm also an event group, which is the old level three uh, coach for jumps now. Uh, and I've completed all the online learning for level three event group for sprints and hurdles and throws. So once I have those integration days, I'll be an event group coach for jumps, throws and sprints and hurdles, which to me is everything for combined events. There's no other higher qualifications that England athletics uh, have from what I can see. I'm more than happy uh, to talk to them about that. And I will chase up next time I have an integration day. Uh, the last time I did ask that on the, the jumps integration day, they said, no, that's all we've got, uh, which is fine. Um, it makes me a little bit sad. I want to push on the sport. Um, 
and a little bit jealous uh, when looking at the statistics of uh, other coaches. I have spotted that some coaches have their old level four qualification for decathlon and heptathlon. Uh, and I wish there was something like that now because I'd love to get it. Um, and the other thing that we're, we're doing now, uh, last Friday, uh, just right at the end of October half term, uh, I ran a workshop, a combined events workshop. And I had quite a few coaches coming from quite far away. Um, Surrey, Hampshire, that kind of thing, Kent, uh, which was really nice to see them. Uh, we got through quite a lot of stuff hurdles, long jump, shot put, high jump, um, all hurdles first, and then the carousel, the other events. And then a question and A session after we broke for lunch. Uh, it was really nice to see everybody. Um, I am booking more dates in the foreseeable future. I've got four or five venues uh, that I'm talking to. It'd be great for them, you know, to come back to me with prices and the rest of it. But as it stands, I'm not making any money from it. Uh, the model is very much a, I can promise X amount of athletes, uh, if you charge them a buffer of six to 15 pounds, whatever the, the place is happy with, um, or what I feel is appropriate. If there's not that many people, it might be 15. If there's loads, it might be six or whatever. And if you can give me four hours of your track during a slow time, then I can guarantee a bit of an income, uh, so a bit of a cash boost. So I'm trying to swing it that way. And some tracks are pretty on it um one or two aren't but you know i think there's there's deeper issues there so i like to think i'm pushing on the sport by running combined events workshops uh i've linked up with rafer rafer joseph he's, he's got me on board with um the combined events hub uh, of coaches i'm really looking forward to that it's really exciting to to get more involved with that so i can't wait to meet everybody um properly um I think the group are doing really well. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty much doing what I thought they'd do. Um, and that's not a poor thing. That's uh, I just planned it particularly well. I knew they'd be roughly here, roughly there. Um, there's no surprises and just, just only good things. Um, but when I start to think of what hasn't gone so well, so... Yeah, as talked about before, the average age of the group is about 14.6, 14.5. And so major internationals are not expected at this stage. And it's almost counterproductive to be talking about them because they're either too far away in time or too far away in standard. Um, we could dream about them, sure, but it kind of detracts from the here and now. Um, only one of them are really what I'd call a major international. That's young Shane. Uh, and, the re and I haven't trained him probably since like February, March. And the real reason for that is, um, it's logistics, you know, it's, it's, he's, he's not the only child, you know, he's, he's got a younger sister that does gymnastics. And the, the day I used to coach him now she's doing gymnastics. And so it's that awkward. So, you know, parents are going to drop off, which kid, and so on. Uh, he's based in the Medway area. I coached him in Canterbury. It's not exactly around the corner. It's not that far either, but it's it's just awkward enough that, you know, they just have to think about it. And luckily, um, Shane's now looked after by Julie, Julie Benterman. Um, and if he's enjoying it and she's producing the good results out of him and he's producing good results, then and he's developing, then and, and good, good. As long as he's developing, enjoying the sport and getting better, can't ask for more than that. So, yeah, if he's, he's, he's always welcome to, to train with us on a Friday or Monday, Wednesday, whenever he feels like. Um, I occasionally message his dad and his dad messages back and all the rest of it. So just lovely family. Um, the squad is relatively healthy. Um, when I say relatively, we've obviously had one athlete that's had major surgery uh, early on in the year because of an injury in November um, and the good news is they're now back into training we're just taking it slowly um, just doing what they can do strengthening up things all the rest of it um, and that's pretty positive but I think it's going to be unlikely that they're going to be performing to their maximum this summer 
I mean, we'll just see how it goes, but it's okay. I'm for them, for me, I think 20, the summer of 2025 is when they'll start to strike back. Um, and then, yeah, since April, late March, April, um, another athlete, young Josh, uh, well, he, he had ankle problems and it turned out he was playing basketball and football and all these other multi-directional sports. Um, and then that, that was made worse by him training all the time with me. So essentially, uh, when I told him to rest and go and see a physio, you know, professional medical advice, uh, that didn't happen until June, July. So a couple of months later, his knee got worse. Um, he had to stop training altogether. Um, fast forward, he went on holiday during August. And yeah, he hadn't trained really since May and his next, his next, well, his first competition back apart from the YDL national finals was English schools combined events. Um, so he had very little preparation for it and he still banged out 150 point PB. Um, you know, you could argue that he, the way he managed that injury and him doing other sports meant he was injured for a extended period of time and thus that impacted his performance um i know for a fact that long jump if this is the stop board where my hand is here he took off 70 70 80 centimeters behind the white of the board and the white of the board is 20 centimeters wide i mean he was he was a country mile behind that board easily a step um one of my steps anyway and yeah because of the announcers, I couldn't hear what the, the jump was, but all I heard was 33. And so in my head, I was thinking, oh, he's a 580 jumper, might have done a PB. He was massively behind the board, so it's probably 533. And it might have been a six meter jump if he was on the board. Fine, fine, fine. Turns out that I was a 633 jump. And considering how windy it was at Bedford at English schools, it's actually a legal wind jump. Um, so he jumped 6.33. He was miles behind the board. Um, and because his run-up was not as well rehearsed as we'd liked, um, because he'd missed training, that potentially could have been a seven-meter-plus long jump, could have been a British record. It would have meant that he'd won that pentathlon by a country mile. Would have been another English schools win. So I'd have three English schools winners. Um, yeah, he he knows all this. We've talked about this ad nauseum. Um but one of my, I'd say, downsides is he's he doesn't see he doesn't see football as the problem. Uh, he doesn't see other sports as the problem, and he's the kind of athlete that will just exercise and exercise and exercise. He's just full of energy, but his body is disintegrating because it can't handle it, and he's just destroying himself. Um, no, he he tells me he's resting. But then I'll get a message from his parents saying, yeah, um, Josh is doing a four hour tennis tournament or something. It's like, oh, that wasn't resting. And it's whenever he does things, it's multi directional sports. It's always tennis or cricket or basketball or things where you're moving around, chop and changing direction. It's never, um, it's never sports where you're constantly going in one direction, like swimming. Or maybe going for a run, you know, it's it's always agility, movement based sports, and so part of why his knees are going is because of that kind of. It's not um, an explosive um, problem with his tendons. It's a it's where the tendons are being stretched and warped rotationally, um, possibly because he's not used to it. And so he's got all of these muscles exploding so dynamically because of his strength uh, in athletics. And then he's applying that to different directional stuff in football. And yeah, his body can't handle it. Um, when it comes to English schools, although PBs were, you know, so we look at performance, not positioning. So his actual performance, they're all PBs. So Josh PBs, Chi Chi PBs, Ollie PBs, Shane PBs. Um, all of the group has PB'd massively. Um, you know, 
they've they've PB'd up the wazoo. I don't think there's a single person in the group that hasn't PB'd at least four or five events. Uh, the only person who hasn't PB'd four or five events is probably Shane because he's only interested in sprint hurdles and four hurdles. And maybe the four by one, four by four, or the 400 flat. Um, but he's PB'd in everything this year. Um, he's the fastest UK non-resident. So he's, he's the fastest non-UK resident athlete in the 110 meter hurdles under 18 level and the 400 meter hurdles under 18 level um, by a long shot. Uh, 100 meter hurdles he's not, but that's because he made the switch to the 110 meter hurdles a bit earlier. And he's he's run that at two major competitions, the NACAC and the Commonwealth Youth Games. So, yes, it's a no, it's a no-brainer for me. Uh, he's just the best. Um, so, yeah, even though the per performance was pretty good, uh, the position was pretty poor. Um, now, some athletes that doesn't apply to. Um, you know, Chi-Chi has been unde undefeated all season. You can't whinge about her positioning at all. I think the only time she's not won a triple jump competition is when she was competing in seniors um, at an open competition. Well, not an open. I think it's the biggest jumps. Uh, I'd have to have a look at the stats. But she, no one her age has beaten her. Um, not by a country mile. Uh, she's the only one that's broken 12 metres in the triple jump. She's done it many, many times. Um, and I'm, I'd be willing to put a large amount of money. She'd be the first British girl to jump 13 metres plus under 17. She's getting the British record um, as long as she stays fit and healthy. And, you know, she's got a good team behind her. She's a smart girl. She won't she won't do anything silly like like possibly Josh or Ollie would. Um, she's focused. She's driven. Yeah. Other girls, are. she's a menace. You know, she's she's going to beat you. It's, it's yeah, it's, it's not looking good for you. Um, so, yeah, as, as far as I'm concerned, as long as she's fit, healthy and happy, that British record's happening next year. Um, and pentathlons and heptathlons is, is the bonus. We're obviously training for them. But I think some of the other challenges are that some of the athletes are going through GCC year um, or final years of A-levels or level two qualifications. Uh, like Jesse is. So yeah, it's tough. It is tough. There there are challenges um, and there are setbacks, but we're you know we're constantly talking. That's that's part of it. Um, we're navigating them fa fairly well. It's just a case of of navigating them. Um, so what's the plan until the next update? So um, the group is still fairly young. Uh, movement skills are still the top priority. Uh, some of them, though, it's going to be movement skills with a twist. So it might be uh, under duress with balancing. It might be stop starting. So balance and tempo work, as you can see in the diagram. Um, it's going to be the movement skills, but with a twist. And so what I've got up there uh, essentially is the plan from October to November, which is more of the winter stuff. And then December to March, which is the more intensive, uh, starting to sharpen up a little bit, really, for the summer. Um, work uh, it doesn't tell you what I'm doing each session but it may be that I use all of this and take little bits and that's might what be a session uh, is made of so it might be a session is made up of hurdles long jump javelin and some running then I'd probably take something from the 100 meter box something from the long jump box something from the javelin box and something from the running box and I think, right, okay, where, where have they been before? I look at my notes. I think, right, how are they feeling at this point in time? Um, and I just tweak it from there. And intensities, um, I've talked about before, but that's the thing that, you know, the movements is always the same. And then the, the quality of the movements, the actual replication and the accuracy of the movements, the actual event, what I change is the intensity. And I, I found that, quite a lot of coaches when it comes to the winter they'll they'll work really hard but the what what changes over the course of the year is the winter they'll be less specific they'll be working more at spe level like weights uh general plyometrics that kind of stuff whereas for me no all of the you know the, the key components of jumping the care bear stair the power movements need to happen all year round um 
And so the potential challenge is now that the athletes have started getting fluent in that, um, which is great because it means they're learning the skills, they're getting better and so on. Um, when it comes to, I'm not saying they're technically perfect, but now they're doing so well that it's very easy for them to get bored. Um, just hammering the basics isn't a challenge to them anymore. And so constant skill progressions, um, doing it with various different resistances, doing it in different contexts um, is going to be my approach to tackling that kind of thing. So yes, we are hammering the basic movement patterns, but it's how you dress it up. It's how you put it into a different context. Um, it, you know, so it, it, it just depends how you dress it up and how you sell it to the athletes, uh, essentially, you know, um, I don't think they're at that level where they're 21, 22. And if I told them to do a particular session, they just get on with it. They're very much, uh, immature, not emotionally developed youngsters and boredom repetition, uh, that mental fatigue affects them more. So, uh, I think if I'd have been a 21, 22 year old, I'd, if, if somebody said to me, do this drill 10 million times over the course of three years, which I don't know if that was like a couple of 10, 10, 20,000 times a day or whatever it is for the next couple of years, I'd have just practiced it. I'd have just got on with it. And I'd just been like, I love this. You know, I, I'd have just, I'd have had the mental wherewithal to just keep cracking on. Whereas these kids are not me, I am not these kids, and so they they need a little bit of um, variety. Um, so that's that's kind of that. If you want to see what I've been doing, I'm not going to talk through that whole table. You can pause this video and have a have a read in. And these are only suggestions and rough ballpark figures. What we're doing, as I said, this is not a training plan. This isn't even a meso cycle plan. Uh, this is more of um, my overview of like what we're doing. And so to, to aid that board, I'm not only going to have different progressions uh, in different contexts and be like, well, what does that mean? Well, in actual fact, we're going to put more games into it. Um, now, they're not going to be kiddie games. They're going to be more like mini competitions in the group. Uh, could be handicapped against, you know, like hip height, weight, that kind of thing. Uh, so it all balances out at the end. And so you're trying to promote how good are you for your shape, for your size, for your weight, that kind of thing. Um, and so yeah, they from from what I've seen, they they enjoy it. It's a little bit of competition, and yeah, it's 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 just nice to see. Um, but there's going to be some challenges. Um, one of them uh, is weights. Um, so because they're starting to get a bit older, and they're starting to see other groups use the weights room, um, they're starting to think, well, hold on a minute why aren't we using the weights room? Um, which is fine, which is a reasonable response. Um, and so there's various different ways that I would um, explain why not. Uh, the first thing is safety. Um, it's very difficult to manage uh, 8 to 10 to 12 uh, teenagers, young teenagers, we're not talking 18, 19, we're talking uh, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 year olds uh, in an environment that is primarily designed for adults, lots of heavy lifting equipment. Uh, it's just not entirely safe. Um, so safety is the number one uh, aspect and kind of partly linked on to safety um, is where are they in terms of their actual physical development? Um, and also, you know, emotional development, maturity, that kind of thing. Um, I cannot, because of the um, the facilities rules, let alone UK rules, I cannot leave them to do weights on their own. Uh, however, luckily, the weights room and the strength and conditioning room at Canterbury, so at Norman Park, Canterbury, there's access so that I can have one foot in the door at the gym watching them. And I can also look at the track so I can send some of the younger athletes out and some of the others to stay in and do weights. Um, also from a UK development point of view, uh, 
are there muscles, tendons, skeletal structure? Are they developed enough yet? And there's a difference between boys and girls, and there's a difference between an 11-year-old and a 21-year-old. Uh, and there is always a difference in training age, whether you've just come into the sport or whether you've been doing the sport for, you know, 10 years plus. There's a lot of things to consider. Um, and when trying to explain this to parents, it can feel a little bit woolly. So what I devised, um, just to make it absolutely clear to all the parents, um, I have left this chronological training age um, table um, on my group WhatsApp. So something I made, please don't take it as a, this is the way, this is just what I have up, just so it just clears any kind of um, questions with the parents, really. Um, and so as you can see in the red, pretty much under 11, under 13, that's a big fat no. Um, medicine ball and resistance band work only. Um, definitely under 15s right up into doing it one or two years in the sport it's also a big no maybe if they've been doing it for two to ten years which i find unlikely but possible i'd probably say 10 to 20 percent of body weight maximum so really that's only slightly heavier than a medicine ball um slow technical work that kind of thing um i know some coaches are like oh well you can use a broom handle and you can practice this stuff i know for a fact for me maybe i'm not flexible enough but if I have a broom handle like that, there'll be a gap between the broom handle and my shoulders. I've actually got to actively pull it down. Whereas if there was a heavy bar, it would just force itself down and I'd be more in a natural. There's just lots of things that just are, are easier with a tiny bit of weight. And although you're trying to teach technique, I just feel with broom handles, it's just not quite the same. So I'd rather just not bother. Uh, there's plenty of, way of get, ways of getting power transference. And to me, medicine balls and resistance bands are, are more than enough at that stage so so why why go any more uh, and as you can see it goes progressively down and so pretty much from under 20 upwards if you've been doing the sport for two to five years i would probably expect your muscles and tendons are developed enough to handle high intensity lifting uh, everyone's that's a relative thing high intensity for me might be extreme intensity for some and low intensity for the others uh, it, it just depends but high intensity as in you can lift what you feel is heavy relatively safely as long as you built up to it and all that kind of thing and it's just trying to not deter people from the gym but just make them think like it's a it's a very um you know it's a multi-faceted problem of when should you be doing weights and i think many people spend too much time in the weights room um and at a young age and i just don't think it's necessary uh, and I actually think it's counterproductive um, in some ways. And we'll talk about that in a second. But um, I know that one of my athletes, Jess, wants to do weights three times a week and comes down the track twice a week. And she, to me, that screams of she's not getting enough technical work or sprinting done. And I kind of see where she's coming from because she's going down the health and sports massage route um fitness kind of thing and and there is the aesthetic of being in the gym being gym fit and she wants to be a personal trainer and do various other things and probably her business is and her uh, career going forward is going to be gym based if she wants it to be um that's what she's studying for and so i totally get it like you you know you want to up upskill yourself and yeah that's just perfectly fine but for heptathlon it's probably not the greatest thing um so yeah um weights have a time and a place but i think you have to see them as supplementary they're not the replacement you know they're 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 supposed to aid training in some way and if it's not aiding your training then why are you doing it um so i i always say that i coach athletes not barbarians i coach athletes not weightlifters i coach athletes not muscle heads i coach athletes not gear freaks it's, you know, it's just, I think there's more, there's more applicable things you could do as a, as a, as an athlete. Um, and speaking of, um, and then finally to conclude, then totally Bondachuk's uh, transfer of training volumes in sport. Uh, it's often quoted, but here you go. So here's a table of some throwers that he studied. Uh, so across the top, you've got 45 meter to 50 meter throwers, 50 to 55 intervals of five meters, right up until 75, 80 meters. 
Uh, if you're throwing 80 meters in the hammer, you are pretty elite as far as I'm concerned. Um, and so all of those numbers in the table are product moment correlation coefficients, which are essentially saying how likely is this to be a positive correlation, i.e. as one thing goes up, the other goes up. So if they both go up or both go down, that's a positive correlation versus a negative correlation where if one goes up, the other thing goes down like a seesaw. So in this context, uh, the larger that number is, or rather the closer it is to one, because one is the maximum value, then the more likely um, that is to benefit what you're about to do. So what do I mean by that? Let's, let's take the, the top left of this box. So throwing a five kilo hammer and a 45 to 50 meter range, uh, that is 0.867. Um, it doesn't actually mean what I'm about to say it means, but if it helps you visualize more what it actually means, then fine, use it. But just be aware it's not it's not what I'm saying. But that roughly means that there is an 86.7% um, match between how much throwing a five kilo hammer transfers to throwing 45 to 50 meters. Or rather, that's a fairly high number, 0.867. So objectively, that is better for a 45 to 50 meter thrower. It's better for them to throw with a five kilo hammer if they're throwing in that distance. Um, so yeah, it's uh, whereas I compare it to the next block over to the right, the 50 to 55, it drops down to 0.765 which means it's still a good transfer. So throwing a five kilo hammer, if you're a 50 to 55 meter hammer thrower, that's still a good thing to do. 0.765 is high. It's just not as good if you're a 45 to 50 meter thrower. So what that's suggesting to me is as the, uh, the hammer throwing athlete is getting better, i.e. moving from 45 to 50 to consistently 50 to 55, that throwing that five kilo hammer isn't as effective as it used to be um, when trying to throw the hammer that the transference of, of progression is not as effective so if i wanted to improve uh if you look if you scroll down a box throwing the six kilo hammer it then jumps back up to 0.866 um so it's probably one strategy reading from this is that once you've gone from 45 to 50 to 50 to 55 you might want to switch up from going throwing a five kilo hammer to a six kilo hammer that's all that means um yeah, and so this table um, and Tony Bondachuk um, gained from um, interviewing and recording hundreds of athletes, of throwers over decades. And these are all just his observations um, computed. And so why is this important? Because it's very clearly at the very top, you can see specialized preparatory and specialized developmental exercises. That's SPE and SDE. So SDE, specialist development exercises, are ones that replicate in part or with resistance the actual event. So that's clearly the throwing the 5K, the 6K, 8K, 9K, 10K, 16K hammers or weights as it gets a bit heavier. And the SPE is where it's using the right energy system, but it's not replicating the movements. So we're pretty much the bottom half so barbells power cleans squats long jumps triple jumps vertical jumps that kind of thing and so uh, what i said in the previous video you want to stay in the sde and above so SD, so from the top the actual event itself competitive exercise sde which is specialized development exercise spe specialist preparatory exercise and then gpe general preparatory exercise and so gpe you might think well what's the point it's a bit rubbish not really it depends what you're trying to go for it could be useful for a warm-up rehabilitation that kind of thing i just question if an athlete was particularly healthy and they were technically fluent you know why are they spending so much time in gpe and i've talked about that at length with you know sprinters spending tons of time in the gpe but you know whatever so if i look at the throwing the 60 to 65 category you can see that throwing a hammer has got fairly high um so when I say throwing a hammer, it's like a 5K, 6K, 8K, 9K, and so on. Fairly high PMCC, product moment correlation coefficient, product moment correlation coefficient. 
is pretty high. So that means the transfer is is a lot better than say the SDE, the special the you know the specific preparatory exercises, which are the weights. So barbell, power, clean, squats, and long jump, and so on. In the point threes, point fours, you know, it's effective. It will lead to a positive improvement in your throwing, but it's not as effective as actually throwing stuff. That's because of the, the techniques and whatever, and it's higher up on the exercise classification hierarchy. So yeah, but then even when you move into the elite stuff um, for weights and the SDE, it becomes even less. And by the way, if it's zero, if it approaches zero, then in actual fact, that's random. That means it, you know, it's hit and miss. It could potentially help. It might not. Um, whereas if we look at throwing, even at the 7580, uh, in actual fact, having a, um, a correlation coefficient of 0.824 with the 10K would kind of imply that if you want to start throwing far, then, you know, throwing heavy, heavy hammers is probably the way forward. Um, but if you look at it going too far with the 16 kg, it drops back down to 0.6. So there's obviously some kind of like wiggle optimum there. But yeah, I just feel that weights have their time and place. They should be supplementary. Uh, I feel for developing decathletes, combined event athletes, heptathletes, or whatever, there are too many movement skills to master first and you shouldn't really be looking at weights uh, for a long, long time. Um, and even if you are, it should be, you know, it should only be supplementing what you're doing. Um, what is critical is your ability to jump, run, throw. Um, no one cares if you were 400 points behind the loser, uh, behind the winner, sorry, but your bench press is 40 kilos heavier or your back squat is 100 kilos heavier. No one cares. You know, you've, you've done the wrong thing. You know, no one cares about what you can do in the gym. It's what you can do at the track. 